Hello and welcome to this week's weekly webinar. My name is Molly Keck and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bexar County and I'm also a board certified entomologist. If you have been dealing with bugs that are in your food, in your cereal, and other things in the pantry, then this webinar will give you an idea of what they might be and how you can try to manage them and what other foods they might be going into and infesting. So stored products pests for most of us are really just a nuisance. We have to throw out the cereal or the flour. They uh, maybe take a little while to kind of remedy themselves. But in reality, stored products pests are a pretty big deal. They destroy about five to 10% of the world's food supply. And in the US alone, that's over a billion dollars of just thrown out food because of these pests per year. The most important stored products pests are either going to be a beetle or it's going to be a moth. And so that's really what we're gonna be focusing on. If there's something in your food, it's a beetle or it's a moth. And both the beetles and the moths have a complete life cycle. And this is important to remember because for the most part, it's the larva form that is the damaging form, but it is the adult form that we recognize that tells us that there's an infestation. So if you're seeing a lot of adults, they came from a lot of eggs, a lot of larva that fed on a lot of food and finally emerged as adults. That indicates when a lot of adults are present that the infestation has been there for a period of time and the food is most likely ruined, it's spoiled, um, out of condition. It's not something that you can probably consume mainly because they've gotten rid of all the nutritional value and they've also gone to the bathroom inside of that food. Stored products pests can be found pretty much anywhere. In homes and pantries, commercial food warehouses have issues with them all the time, food processing plants, shipping plants, warehouses, restaurants, museums also because there's some stored products pests that love high protein. Well, they may have, and they also like cellulose material. Well, they may have baskets or they may have hides or um, leather goods that these guys are attracted to. And there's multiple other places where you can get stored products pests. One of the most famous places to get them is going to be in a feed store or a pet store where we have pet food, um, dog food, bird seed, things like that, that they're attracted to. And there's not the same regulations on those types of foods as there are on food that is consumed by humans. So how these infestations happen you could never really figure it out from ground zero. In the crops alone, there are, there are certain insects that will go after the food after they've been harvested and they have been put in some sort of storage like si a silo, they can have severe infestations at that point. Also during processing, during the grinding up of the wheat to make flour, um, in the equipment, they can be in all of the little the dust particles from processing that food. And then once it's packaged and stored, they can also infest it at that point. They can infest it when it's in transport to the grocery store and they can, can, they can infest it at the grocery store or it could be a brand new infestation in your house. So how you got them, it's unknown. Usually um, it, you maybe will be able to blame the store or not, but most likely it's older food that's been in your pantry for a long period of time that is more attractive to these insects. They come in from outside, from nature, and they find that food. In nature, they're feeding on this type of food that's just outside. Commonly infested products include those with plant proteins, so these are usually grain-based products, cereals, meal, corn, uh, cornmeal, things like that. Also dried vegetables, fruits, and even nuts. Spices, which people don't always realize, but is generally the oldest product inside your pantry. Also dried flowers and potpourri. So oftentimes because there are potpourri or dried flowers, decorative type things, they might be found in places that's not necessarily your pantry. They might be infesting a, a bathroom or they may be infesting an area where you have these decorations or even your attic where you've placed those decorative items away for a period of time until that season comes around when you wanna bring them down and decorate the house. Chocolates and candy can also be infested with stored products, pests, and very attractive to them. So if you have uh, dried chocolate or um, chocolate for baking that you don't, and you don't bake and use it all that often, that can be a source of infestation. Dried pet food is also usually a common, common culprit for stored products pests. 
Then they can be attracted to products with animal protein, so hides and furs, trophy heads, museum specimens, insect collections. They can also be attracted to feathers, dried meats and cheeses, and dried milk, beef jerky, things like that they might be feeding on, and then also woolens and silks. So you want to identify, are they mainly attracted to plant proteins or are they an insect that's attracted to also animal protein? So you can check around if you have some taxidermied animals to ensure that they're not after those things. Now there's a couple, a few different types of feeders. So some insects are internal feeders and these are significant because they only are attracted to whole grains or whole seeds. So we might find these internal feeders in rice, in corn, in um, whole grains uh, inside of some sort of bird seed. These generally lay their eggs inside this, the kernel and feed on it and make it not nutritious for us anymore. External feeders are larvae that develop outside the whole grain, but they're capable of feeding on whole grains and, as well as processed grains. Scavengers only attack those things that have been processed or damaged in some way. So the seed coat of that grain or that seed must have been broken. This is where you find them in cereals, any other processed grains, pastas, um, cornbread mix, items such as that. And then secondary pests are those that infest grain that is out of condition or moldy. It's products that you're probably not going to consume because it's gone bad or rancid and they're attracted to those products. So internal feeders, while we have a handful of them, I'm only going to mention weevils and bean beetles. The anguimoy grain moth generally is more of an issue in a feed store or in a flour mill type of a situation um, or more of a commercial setting where you have a lot of whole grains. Most people, when they say that, when they see that they have insects in their food, assume that they're weevils. But in reality, weevils in food only are attracted to whole grains. Rice is a common culprit, corn or popcorn is a common culprit, or if you're a hunter or you like to feed the deer that come around your house, the, the, um, the, the seed from the, the deer corn is also very attractive to them. If you have birds, a parrot, or you have bird seed, wild bird seed, and it has whole corn in it, pieces of corn in it, then they may be also in those products. And the most common one that we get is the rice weevil, but it's not just specifically attracted to rice. It will go after other items as well, especially that deer corn. So the rice weevil, being a weevil, has a very long snout. The snout makes a weevil a weevil. So they have a long snout and at the end of that are their mouth parts. The adults kind of have four lighter spots on their wings and what happens is the mother will chew a hole in the grain and then lay her eggs in that hole and then those babies will hatch. The egg, one egg in one grain and one baby feeds it out, eats it out, and so it's basically just a shell and it's no longer nutritious to us. They live a pretty good long life and one female can lay up to 400 eggs. So that's very quickly, if you have several of them, very quickly do you have a pretty good infestation and uh, all of that food is gone. In a commercial setting, they like rice, corn, and wheat. In a residential setting, Indian corn, dried flour, dried arrangements. So around Thanksgiving time, when you start to decorate with some of that maize or dried corn, you might find these guys crawling along your, your table where you have those arrangements. You can see the hole that they've, in one of those um, kernels of corn that they've emerged from. And they're also really common in rice that is in um, some sort of open packaging, not in like a nice good sealed Tupperware container, and rice that you've had for a long time. If it's older than three months old, then it's much more likely to be infested with these weevils. Another guy that you might find on peas or dried beans, uncooked beans, are is the bean or pea weevil. And these guys are a weevil that don't have a long snout but they are found very, very often on black eyed peas, especially around New Year's when you pull out your old black eyed peas to cook and you realize you have these little tiny holes in them. If you have dried peas, they might be attracted to that. So that's kind of a, a snack that some people like to, to eat. And if you don't eat a lot of them and they sit for a long time, they can be found there. And they're also found on peanuts as well. Not boiled peanuts generally, but raw peanuts. They will leave a round hole as they exit the bean. And what's interesting about these guys is that they can be damaging in the field, attracted to the food in the field, but also in storage. 
So some of the external feeders, so these are more processed grains a lot of times, are your drugstore or cigarette beetles, Indian meal moths, and then there's one called the Mediterranean meal moth that we're not going to go over. This is much, much more common in flour mills or anywhere where there's a lot of baking and there's just flour dust that settles all the time and it's very difficult to constantly get that cleaned up. They're not as much of an issue in a home unless you're doing a lot of baking and you're not really cleaning that flour up. The drugstore beetle is a small beetle that from above you can't see its head so it's kind of got a tucked under head. These guys are attracted to lights and they can fly so sometimes people realize that they have an issue with them when they're attracted to a light that they're reading from at night in the living room that's close to the pantry or they're attracted to an outside light um, but they're usually can be found like along a windowsill and then somewhere very in very close proximity is what they're infesting and they're attracted to a variety of products. They like pet food, they like cereals, they like drugs. That's why they get the name drugstore beetle. So if you are finding them in your bathroom or in a weird pantry that maybe you put your aspirin and other items in the kitchen, that might be what they're attracted to. Open up all your old prescriptives. Think about things that you got as a prescription and don't use very often. Maybe you had a surgery three years ago and you're holding on to that pain medication. That could be where those drugstore beetles are infesting and finding food. They've also been known to get into things like Ridex. Um, you can find them in, you know, items that you find that you store underneath your your um, your sink. Um, rat bait also is another thing that they can be attracted to. In the pantry, they like spices, they like dried fruits, they like flowers, and they like pastas. A lot of times, I get calls from. Um, banks and they say we have these little beetles that are all over our tellers desks well I will ask them do you have um, treats for dogs when they come through the bank through the drive-through in the bank and and sure enough inside of that package is where they have an infestation of, of that item so dog food dog treats that's also very very likely for these guys to infest and so you want to check all those items out to determine where they are throw that stuff out and you can solve your issue of course, that's probably not very tasty to your dogs or your uh, to your pets. They can still eat it. It's not going to hurt them, but it's not as nutritious. It probably has a bad taste to it. Um, it's better probably just to toss it out. Now, conversely, the cigarette beetle, which is very similar to a drugstore beetle and also likes many of the same food items that the drugstore beetles do, these guys um, are a little bit smaller, a little bit more humped. They're also attracted to lights and they can fly, but they kind of like subdued lights instead of bright lights. And they're very commonly found flying on very cloudy days. Um, inside of the house, they infest pet food, cereals, tobacco products. So if you have dried tobacco that is not used very often, cigars that someone is storing, really just collecting them but not actually smoking them very often, they can be feeding on that. Peppers is another one, dried peppers, spices, dried fruits, seeds, flour, pasta, basically anything of plant origin is something that a cigarette beetle will feed on. Now, the Indian meal moth is a moth that is super common in pantries and around homes, and they can be very irritating and very difficult to manage, especially if you have a very packed pantry. They can move from the kitchen area and start to move to other areas of the house, finding food in those locations, um, and they can be extremely aggravating to try to manage. The Indian meal moth is kind of a reddish color. It's a two-tone type of a wing, um, kind of has Indian tapestry type look to the wing, and that's how they uh, get that name. But they're not a very large moth, about a quarter of an inch or so. They are nocturnal. They're more active at night, and they are attracted to light. So generally, it's nighttime. The lights have been turned on in the kitchen, and that's when they start to flutter around and move. When the infestation is very high, you can see flying during the day as they get disturbed, but generally it's evening time that you notice them. These feed on grains and any grain products, dried fruits, seeds, nuts. They love macadamia nuts, cashews, things that aren't used very often. They will feed on popcorn, dried popcorn and popped popcorn. They like um, candies, dried red peppers, which is interesting. So if you're, if you um, collect the little packages of dried red peppers from the pizza place and you don't use them quite as often, they can find that and be attracted to it. Pet food, uh, wild bird seed especially. I have found them feeding on the uh, 
the 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 um, flour that coats the fried onions. I've also found them in chocolates and cocoa. So you know these are also other things that they can feed on. What happens is their silk. They so they produce a silk, and it's the the larvae that do all the feeding. But the moths are what tell you you have an issue. Well, those larvae will leave the food, and they they will also spin a lot of silk inside of the food. So generally, that's when you realize something's weird with my pasta. And you look inside and you see all of this this um, silkiness, and that's usually those guys um, feeding on it. Another thing that they love to get into is the pastas that have the dried um, vegetables and peppers, the, the um, dehydrated things inside of the same box because it's kind of a double whammy. The problem with that silk is that it can plug up milling machines. So commercially, they can be a, 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 an issue beyond just ruining the food. Inside of your pantry, this is what it would look like. That kind of the larva feeding on those cashews, the fecal material that you see as kind of sawdust in there, and then lots of webbing that occurs. The pupa leave the food and they will find a crack they'll, or a corner. They'll get up in the corner to pupate. They'll pupate between um, packaging of cardboard boxes, underneath items, on the top underside of your, of your pantry shelves. Um, behind the door hinges they'll just find a nice quiet place away from their main food source to um, infest and so this is a relatively tidy pantry but this is a place where there are hundreds of spots where an indian meal moth could pupate and you don't catch them and so then they become adults and the infestation continues and continues so really good cleaning is important and inspecting every single item whether it's opened or not to make sure that they are not either pupating and making a cocoon or they have infested the actual food. So those that are scavengers and they go after mainly, so they're not going after nuts, they're not going after seeds, they're going after all of the processed and broken down grains. The main ones are sawtooth grain beetles and sometimes we'll get flower beetles as well. So sawtooth grain beetles are really common in cereals if and flour. If, if you don't have Indian meal moths, this is probably who you're dealing with. They are not very large. They're very thin and they have these kind of serrated looks to their thorax, which is the area just beyond the head. They cannot fly and they are not attracted to light. So they are, uh, their movement is going to occur very slowly and they're really going to be restricted to one location. They feed on any grain or processed grain, oats, oatmeal, pet foods, they will go after seeds that are broken. They will go after dried fruits, rice, grain meals, sugar, chocolates, hot cocoa especially, um, drugs as well, especially after the drugstore beetles kind of gone in and done some damage, pasta, and they'll also go after tobacco. Flower beetles are a little bit larger of a beetle. Um, they are really mostly found in flower type items or cornmeal type things. We have the red flower beetle in the south of the United States. Confused flower beetle is called such because it gets confused for the red flower beetle. They eat the same thing, they do the same damage, so knowing the difference between the two isn't necessarily important as a homeowner. That red flower beetle is attracted to lights and it can fly and they like flowers and cereals, pet foods, spices, uh, whole grains that have been infested by other stored product beetles as well, um, but mainly the broken, very processed type food, not whole grains. One thing that I would point out is that flower beetles look very similar to something called a powder post beetle. And in addition to that, even the drugstore beetle looks like a type of beetle that will infest um, wood. And so you do wanna make sure that if you're having a pest control company or you identify this, or you're sending it to me for identification, that you give as much detail as possible. Yes, you might be finding it in the kitchen, but is it specific to the pantry? Have you looked through some of that food? You want to make sure that you're not confusing something that could be a significant pest in damaging your wood versus something that's just inside of your cereal that you could toss out. So do good inspecting and make sure that you differentiate between the two and that you give whoever you're asking for help from the most information possible. Now, some of these pests can be secondary feeders, which mean that they feed on things that are out of condition. So moldy food that's not very good. And that there's a few that we're gonna talk about here, spider beetles, mealworms, foreign grain beetles, and plaster beetles. 
Spider beetles look like spiders. They love to feed also on feathers and they like to feed on um, dead skin cells. I mean, they just are a scavenger of things that are pretty high in protein. They're often very commonly found trying to make a pupa case between mattresses and, and um, the box springs, especially in hotels. And so people get very nervous when they see them because they kind of resemble a bed bug, but the legs are just, to me, way too long. Um, but this is this can be found in your out of condition moldy gross grains. Mealworms do the same thing. They really like they really love moldy oatmeal. When we um, raise mealworms in lab, that's all we feed them is oatmeal, and we don't we don't take care of the oatmeal. We leave it out in the open. We let it get nice and moist. But they are generally really common. If you have backyard chickens, they're going to be what infests your backyard chicken feed that gets a little bit wet. They also will be found under bedding and maybe in the chicken coop where some of the feed has been kicked, and they're just feeding on that kind of out of condition grain there. Foreign grain beetle and the next beetle that I'm going to show you are very interesting insects. They feed on molds and mildews associated with grain products, but they'll also be found in new housing where maybe it was very, very wet when they were doing the taping and the floating and putting up the sheetrock. And so there's mold that's available for them to feed on. So these guys are very, very small, about two millimeters long. The other one is called a plaster beetle, and it is as small as a pinhead. It is itty bitty tiny. And oftentimes you'll see these guys emerging from a base under a baseboard if the if if you think back to when your house was remodeled or when it was built and it was extremely wet while they were doing while the the um, walls were exposed before the texture went up and the painting went up then it's very likely that they're feeding on the mold that's trapped behind there as long as there's no longer any moisture they're helping take care of something. Just because you find them does not necessarily mean that you have a black mold issue in your house. What it more likely means is that the new construction or the um, renovation that had been done, uh, things were sealed up before things dried out adequately. It was a wet month, it rained a whole lot. It may or may not be the contractor's fault, and they're taking advantage of the food that is there. So if the problem persists and persists and persists as they're coming out of cracks in the baseboards or along windowsills, or you find them in your garage, then you might consider, do I have some sort of a leak? But if the problem goes away, and generally it will, it just tells you that's what happened. It's, it's disconcerting, people get scared, but it's really nothing, no reason to crack open the walls and take a look on the inside, as long as you're sure that things are dried up well. So trying to control these stored products pest first, identify, educate yourself, um, do an inspection, identify what you have, figure out what they like to feed on. And once you know what kind of foods they like to feed on, inspect everything. Exclusion is very good. Um, try to put some of those products that they might like in Tupperware containers. You can place things in the refrigerator or in the freezer to try to kill what might be in there or to protect that food for the time being. Proper lighting is really something that is more important if you're in a commercial setting. These guys like uh, are attracted to bright lights but may not like yellow colored lights. Store things properly, don't leave things wide open, seal things up nice and tight. Make sure the temperature and the humidity is, is not too hot and not too humid. And then rotate your food. If you're not going to eat that food within three months, certainly if it's not gonna be consumed within six months, consider small, buying a smaller amount. Also inspect any new product that you bring in. Um, if you think about when you go to the grocery store and you go down the aisle where all the baking goods are and um, you pick up the flour, it's sprinkled out, it's falling down on the ground, there's just always going to be some insect issue because food is constantly there. So inspect your products when you purchase it. Again, purchase the big things that you can do is purchase smaller quantities. If the packaging's broken, obviously don't buy it. And the larger quantities that you have to purchase, put it in the freezer. Pay special attention to your pet foods, bird seeds, and your spices. Those are items that either we don't use very often, or they're items that are not regulated or inspected as well as other food products are. One thing that you can also use are these um, 
monitors or pheromone traps. These are not really a great source of control, but they're wonderful for monitoring populations. You think you threw out the food that those Indian meal moths are attracted to and you put out your, your um, pheromone traps and they're still coming to it, you know you still have a source somewhere. The way a pheromone trap works is it's got a sticky bottom portion to it and it either inside of that is impregnated with a pheromone or chemical or you place a pheromone um, piece in there. And that pheromone tells the boys that there's a girl there. And so it tricks them and they're attracted to it trying to find their mate and they get stuck to the sticky trap. So it slowly will reduce a population but really not significant enough that it will eliminate it oftentimes. You have to find the source and eliminate the source and all the other subsequent sources that they have moved into. So again, um, some physical control that you can use, seal things seal them out of the house also discard them make sure it's sealed get that food out of the house freeze your food below 27 or colder for two to seven days if it's not that cold then keep it in there for a couple weeks if the food can be heated without going bad heat it very low 120 for 60 to 90 minutes no the microwave will not do the trick reduce the clutter reduce the packaging the cardboard clean things out very well especially if it's an indian meal moth population clean um, use your vacuum and just kind of sweep up the extra debris of food that has fallen down so that they're not finding other particles of food that they're feeding on. Very rarely do you have to use chemical control. Even when we're working with pest management professionals, it's not highly recommended. It's really sanitation and source control. And the main reason is because there are very, li very little, almost no products that are available, especially to homeowners that are labeled for use in and around areas where you handle and prepare food. Certainly there's nothing that is labeled for you to use um, on your actual food. You would never want to consume that. I hope you enjoyed this webinar, learned a little bit about pantry pests. Be sure to check out other webinars on this YouTube channel, my extension 210. And if you ever have questions, there's my contact information. Always happy to help identify or answer your pest issues.